Thank you so much, distinguished ladies and the gentlemen, for inviting me uh, to this uh, amazing program. I'm DBC KK. I'm speaking today from the United States of America. And let me begin by apologizing that I'm unable to make it in person to this program in Toronto, Canada. And I will be having a conversation with you today. And that conversation, I've titled it The Journey technology and the world, the frictions of nations. In other words, having a conversation by extrapolating the theme of this program, which you've actually looked into by saying that you want to understand that journey for professionals to move from where they are and look at opportunities of the future. So technology you understand remains a very critical elements in advancing the wealth of nations and changing the ordinance of market system. I will look in how the technology has shaped our world by helping us to face frictions, challenges, and problems that we have in the world. So let me begin by, of course, making it evident that our world, of course, has so many frictions, of course, despite the opportunities and so many things that we have gotten really, really right. If you go to many parts of the world, we see wars, Ukraine, Russia, we go to Africa, people are still suffering because of lack of basic clean water, the issues of famine in most parts of the world. You know, there are just frictions and challenges, not just because we as a people cannot feel some of them living in North America, but if you just take back to most parts of the world, you can see that there are frictions everywhere. So our world is full of frictions. And interestingly, it is actually because of these frictions that many things we do in life will become very, very evident. And across human society, across human history, these frictions have become exceedingly critical for us to change the destinies of nations and the destinies of continents. So I'll show you here a plot that shows the GDP of the United States and Canada. These are the two dominant economies of today. So I'm using them for these uh, extrapolation to shape how the gross world product and aggregate of all the GDPs of the world have looked over the last 2000 years. If you can just look here, you can realize one thing, that more than about 1,500 years, just from here to here, that the GDP of China, the GDP of the United States, or the gross world product, basically the GDP of flats. What was going on here was this, that despite the fact that human population was growing, human economic activity was not accelerating. In other words, that people that lived here were actually poorer than people that lived here because the per capita income was decelerating because when you have a higher population, and you are not seeing an economic growth, it means that generational people were actually getting poorer. I call this era, flattened era, and invention society era. An invention society era basically means there were so many ideas here, but they had limited products and services. They had limited products and services because they lacked the capacity of turning those ideas into products and services that could actually have helped them to fix frictions which were in their societies. So when nations lack capacity to turn ideas into products and services, they have not actually done so many things. Africa, Latin America, and not East Asia, in some other pockets of the world, most of them are still stuck in this flattened GDP. They are extremely very brilliant people there, they have ideas on paper, but they have not turned that invention into innovation. The people that lived here were some of the most important people in development of modern physics and chemistry. They helped us to understand compounds. They helped us to understand natural philosophy. But when polio came, they died. When tuberculosis came, they died because they could not turn those compounds into vaccines. They just look here, just at the birds of the former America. You can now see here that a flattened GDP started moving into an exponential one. And you can also see that China caught up that 
a flattened GDP also started ramping up. In other words, if you can check what has happened here, you will see that there is actually a massive translation. That massive translation, what has happened there is that they have taken out most of the frictions they have in their societies and they have fixed them and they are now offering an economic opportunity to their people. And then when you look through here, of course, then the virtual society will give you innovation society. And even as we are looking at this innovation society, many beautiful things are coming. We call them the wave one, we call them the wave two. And in that wave two, we are seeing AI system, autonomous systems, and new species of technology systems, which continue to change the ordinance of market system. And as these things are happening, there is going to be abundance in the future. And it's through those changes that that journey that we are talking about, we can. It's through the opportunities that these market systems provide that those professionals of today will have opportunities for professionals of tomorrow. So, but the question here is this, that not every part of the world is going to experience the same thing. Just like Africa to a large extent is still stuck here in a GDP that is not growing. Why we are, we are seeing more than quadratic growth in some GDPs in the world. That next phase of wave two of innovation society, society where people are turning ideas into products and services to overcome frictions in their society, we may not just experience that way. So how are we going to now as professionals participate in this journey? And I'll show you that the stage is the market system. The market system is where everything happens because markets inherently is imperfect in nature. And that inherent nature of imperfection makes it difficult for demand and supply to come into a near perfect equilibrium point. And across human history, one thing has become evident that you need companies. It's only when you have companies that is when you can now bring demand and supply into a near equilibrium point. You have just landed in the city of Toronto for this program today. And unfortunately for you, you don't have a family member or there is no restaurant in the city of Toronto. And if that is the case that there is no restaurant in Toronto and you don't have a family member whom you can go to eat food from, you have really very limited options. And one of those options that you begin to knock at every house in Toronto, looking for somebody who has food to sell. The same time you are knocking at that person's house, there are also people that have food. They are hoping that you will knock on their doors. But it turns out most times you cannot discover them. They cannot discover you because market systems have what we call information asymmetry problem. Information asymmetry problem basically says that you know something as a customer that the producer does not know. And the producer knows something that you do not know. And because two of you cannot come into a perfect equilibrium point, transaction cannot take place. And across human history, one thing has had the ability to overcome that problem. And what is that thing? That is what we call companies. And then somebody wakes up in Toronto and said, I'm going to start up a restaurant. I'll call it the best restaurant in town. And the next time you are now in Toronto, instead of knocking at people's door, what do you do? You simply go to that restaurant. And when you go, they serve you food. You pay them. That payment is a compensation for them helping you to overcome that hunger, which is a friction that you have. The restaurant is a company. The restaurant has helped you to overcome the friction. And companies exist because they help us to solve frictions that we have in markets. Those frictions could be in many ways. It could be the frictions in restaurant business. It could also be frictions in banking. That's what they do. And it's by solving those frictions that every person here, every one of us will have an opportunity in market. And it's also through solving those frictions that our future as professionals will be defined, will be determined, and will be accelerated. Because at the end of all things, there is a stage for that journey, that journey of the career that we want to take. And that stage happens in companies. You have got $1,000 Canadian dollars. You don't have anything to do with it. For the next 12 months, 
but you want to lend it to somebody, you can't just find somebody easily. And at the same time, there is somebody in Quebec that needs that money, you know, so expand a little business. That person is hoping that you find him and you are also looking that you find him. Interestingly, assume there is no bank in Canada. You don't really have a lot of options. But there is something that happens. A young lady opens up a bank in Toronto and you take that money into that bank. Then that bank, now through his branch office in Quebec, can also lend that money to that individual. What the bank has done, it has overcome that friction that both of you had. And by overcoming that friction, it has improved the system, making it possible that demand and supply can have a perfect point where transaction can take place. So that becomes a fundamental element that defines the world of work. That we have to overcome frictions through companies. And for companies to overcome frictions, they need to build capabilities. Capabilities are the things that now make those companies where they are. There are so many dimensions of capabilities, technical capability, managerial capability, industrial know-how capability, marketing capability, everything that we learn in universities, everything that we do at work, those are capabilities. As companies acquire capabilities, they become better because they can now use those capabilities to fix frictions that exist in the market. And those frictions that exist in the market are going to become the instruments that help to overcome the problems in society. Because companies are agents that are built to overcome frictions. And the only way to overcome friction is by building products and services. Because products and services are forces that overcome the friction our market, which is also a resistant force. What are going to be the components of those capabilities? They announce four key things. Knowledge. As we go through the journey of careers, even as immigrants, or people in diaspora, or native citizens of Canada beyond, knowledge is key. Because we need knowledge to build and combine the factors of production. If we don't have knowledge, we can't just do anything. And that's why it's so important these days in the knowledge economy that that knowledge has to be sharp, fresh, and extremely very, very destructive. If you go back to the Bible, you read one thing, it's evident that when Moses appeared before the Israelites, that they marveled because he studied under Pharaoh. And they knew that because Egypt had the best educational system at that time, they, he was well prepared and qualified because he had knowledge. And across human history, a people will rise on knowledge before they can rise in commerce. The finest moments in Greeks was actually when they have some of the finest philosophers ever lived. If you go back to the old time of Babylon, the old time of Persia, you just see one thing was consistent. The knowledge of a people will give them the capacity for them to win a market system. And the best of America today is not because they made these javelin bombs and all these measles and rockets. Or they, they have great educational institutions that help them produce knowledge systems that can actually make them a very great country. And just like Canada also has the capacity to create new knowledge, apply new knowledge, deploy new knowledge, and refine knowledge systems, it makes it a very great country. So knowledge is key. And in that knowledge, we have opportunities as professionals for today and for tomorrow, that if we keep deepening our knowledge capacity, we are going to win the world because we need knowledge to build capabilities that can help us to overcome frictions, which are evident in markets. Of course, capital. When you don't have certain things, you can also need that capability to buy the elements that we do not have. There is also the mindset of being a risk taker. We need to have pioneers in markets. The pioneers in markets, we're talking about people that are going to become change makers who can see problems and they go to tackle those problems. Look at the B.Y. Mellon, look at Rockefeller, look at Kenigi, look at Dan Gote in Africa. Then so, so many of them, these are people that are helping us. To, they have this special capability that they can help us to overcome the frictions by, by making it possible that they can build better process services that markets will actually use. Of course, for most of us, we fall under labor. 
the executors of business models. When we have that knowledge, when we have that entrepreneurial spirit, when we have acquired those elements we do not have, at the end of the whole thing, we need to execute a model in that market to overcome that friction so that we can make our world a better place. The future of our professional careers will line on our ability to be ready, to be prepared with the technology, with the knowledge, with the capacity of today for the opportunities that we watch. And all these things are now encapsulated under the processes of firms, the tools of firms, and the people of firms. The people in the companies, the processes the company deploy, and the tools that they use is become the foundation upon which we can build the empires of the future. So as we go through this conference and looking at that topic or that team, the journey, the journey that as professionals we go through, whether we are just landing in Canada as new immigrants or whether we were born in Canada, we've been living here for a long time, it's that we have an opportunity to capture something of value to see where we can play a role. But as you go through this, there is something that has become very evident. That thing that has become very evident is that technology has become an instrument that will make it possible for market systems to fix the frictions which are in people's lives. And I'll take you back to the great debate of the Greek philosophers where they were trying to understand the material component of the universe. Heraclitus had noted that the world is nothing but fire. Taos had noted that the world is made nothing but war. But I like what Pythagoras, the guy that gave us the Pythagoras theorem, in most and noted that the world is nothing but numbers. Pythagoras made a postulation that the world is absolutely numbers. And if the world is nothing but numbers, because everything in life can be put into numbers, can be expressed in numbers, can be quantified and modeled, and could be expressed in a numerical form, it means that the business of humanity is nothing but understanding numbers. And of course, across human history, that has always been what we've been doing. From the time of slide rule to abacus, to the time of the INIA, difference engine, INIA, CUNIA, Shockley invention of transistor, to the integrated circuit invention by Shockley, by, by Robert Noyes and, and, and Jalkibi in 1957, the world has been looking at one thing. How do we make sense of numbers? Because the more we make sense of numbers, the more we understand our world. And if we understand our world, the more we fix frictions that are in the world. So from numbers, we make sense. And how do we make that we need to be a calculating system? We need to build computational system. We, build, we need to build computer system. And then by building those computational system, we can now understand the interfaces that link the world. You build better companies of the future. We need to have those companies run on numbers. Because the more you understand numbers of your customers, the more you can serve them. The more you understand the numbers around your patient as a medical doctor, the more, the better you have the capacity to actually cure them, help them get better. You know, if you go into the field and room of fix engineering, where specialize in PhD, how you build it, all those uh, microelectronics, biomorphic systems that have the capacity of uh, Basically, understanding human biology, doing what we call event driven, asynchronous parallelism of the central nervous system. What you're trying to do here is to understand the human anatomy. And understanding human anatomy, begin to replicate those constructs in, in integrated circuits. So, at the end of the day, if you understand the numbers of humans around humans, the better you can actually become a better doctor, a better engineer to build biomedical systems that can be used for humans. The better you understand the, the numbers in the market, the better you can serve the customer. So uh, the world is nothing but numbers. It means that building machines can help us understand markets. And it means that those and companies that deploy more of these systems will have a better opportunity to win. And that is where the future will be defined. The future of your job, the professional life, the opportunities you have will be built on numbers. And if you make sense of anything you do in a career to make 
making more evidence. Asymptotically better, you have more, a better professional life. And how we have known that, how do you make those numbers better? You build what they call cloud computing systems. That's where you store what you call data, and that data is actually numbers. Because the cloud makes it possible that you can have an infinite, in quote, computational capabilities. It means that you can now have the opportunity to understand your markets better so that you can fix the frictions in those markets. And if you do that, you go back to the invisible hand by Adam Smith. That productivity will come because through numbers, you understand better the challenges the market has. Through numbers, you know what the customers want, what customers need, what customers require, so that you fix them. And when you are fixing the problems in markets, you are creating products and services, you drive an innovation society. Innovation society, as you noted, we have already stated that what really matters is not invention of ideas, but the ability to turn those ideas into products and services. Reverend Marcus, many, 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 many years ago, was struggling to understand how the world will cope because food production was going in arithmetic progression while human population was growing in the geometric population. And Reverend Martha said that the world was gonna run out of food. He never imagined that we could move into an age of exponential technological growth. And that exponential technological growth will turn a world that is inventive into a world that becomes innovative. And in the world of innovation, we're going to have beautiful machines that attract us, that can now help us to produce food at a very, very better pace. So the postulation of Reverend Matos did not happen because the world became innovative and the world was able to drop productivity. And when the world drops productivity, we can now have food that the problems many of us have in Canada today is not whether we find food, but how we can actually stop eating a lot of food. That's it. So a new market now has been formed. Exercise, eat well, because if you continue to eat as you see it in Canada, I tell you one thing, you get into trouble because you don't even need to pray before you eat because you have so much food that there is no need for you to pray. But remember, when you are in Mali, when you are in Nigeria, hey, you have to pray a lot because you are not sure what will come the next time. So that's the world we live in. And it's the world of abundance for those that have unlocked that capacity of the invisible hand that Adam Smith postulated. And if you go through markets, you can see a pattern. 100 years, a capture of the movement towards numbers, towards better market system, towards what Pythagoras postulated. 1917, the best and the largest company in the United States was US Steel, a steel company. 50 years later, the largest traded public company in the US was IBM. Now, in our time, Apple, and then you have all these. So what is happening here? Construction, 100 days ago, later infrastructure companies to power technology systems. Now we are now looking at infrastructure companies to power where the numbers to be resident. They were the leading companies at a time. But what you have today are largely knowledge companies. These are data companies. And data companies are closer to numbers than infrastructure companies. But even the infrastructure companies are closer to numbers than steel companies. And that translation has to happen in every society, in every market. Because the more you move from this to this, the more efficient you become. Because when numbers power anything you do, you become better in whatever you do. I'm using the snapshot of Nigeria to show the leading companies in Nigeria, MTN infrastructure, Airtel infrastructure, construction, Tango de Cement, Boa Cement, food, Nestle. That's the state we are. Here, when I look to America, I can see most of the leading companies are knowledge company. You may say that Tesla is a manufacturing company, no. Tesla sells software systems. If you buy a Tesla and you want to sell it, the next person has to talk to Tesla to get a license back. And they, they sell a lot of credits. So if you look at Tesla, the gene, this company is just something more than selling cars. And a lot of knowledge, a lot of 
knowledge systems here. So these are data companies and they are very closer to data. They're very closer to numbers than these ones. So that means that for Nigeria, for Africa in general, massive opportunity will be translating this phase so that in 15, 20 years, we begin to see those knowledge companies. And that is actually what is going to happen. And that's what I have called it the journey in Africa. The journey here means the journey we have to take, the opportunities in the market that we have to take. And the first generation banks, if you go back to history, in Africa happened in 1990s when some of the leading banks of today were established. And you, in 20s, we had the voice telephony when MTN, Elta, Econet, whatever they were called at that time, one of them were established. And now, 10, 10 years later, we have the age of mobile internet. There are phones, there are smartphones in Lagos, Nairobi, Ogadagu, Tatum, they became machines that we were using to communicate. We are now in the application utility era. We are young people, innovators, are now combining the computational capabilities of those computational systems and smartphones, back in day or software, software that is eating our frictions and also saving us from those frictions. And as they do this thing, massive changes are happening. You see the logistics, retail, e-commerce, financial services, real estate, every sector will be transformed. And when they have finished, you are going to see a shift what will become evident here. Of course, there is a risk most of them will not list in Africa because most of them are already read on the side. But what I'm trying to say is the largest financial institution in Nigeria, for example, today is not any bank. It's actually Florida Wave that is worth at least $3 billion. What that means is that if it has to list, let's assume Nigeria, it would have actually turned this place into that data-driven company because it's a fintech that fees on data. So that is going to be the moment, the opportunity of the future that many of us are expecting. And you have to look at how that change can begin to unlock better value for Africa. We are just about $3 trillion in GDP, about $2.7 trillion. That is extremely very small for a continent of more than 1.3 billion people. But that means that the diaspora, you, all of us, working with those natively, indigenously at home at the moment. And of course, our partners, the Canadians, Americans, the Australians, and Chinese, the Russians, and every person helping us to unlock value in a continent by connecting, for example, to the beautiful uh, country of Canada. So what I'm saying here is that that journey has to start and that journey, the destination has to be Africa because uh, agriculture, healthcare, financial services, real estate, education, and all domains of technology systems are waiting for us to turn them using technology from the stage they are into what the Pythagoras has postulated. They have to become numbers. The more we turn them to numbers, the numbers driving whatever that we are doing, the better we can build a better economic system. As we do that, we can say this is the destination. That destination is abundance for all. Abundance for all, not for you to rise, not for me to rise. But not that you have reason because you're in Toronto, or not that I have reason because I'm in America. Is that we fix frictions, we build companies to see frictions, build companies, technology powers, that the rise of all through shared prosperity, that the journey you started in that career, that future, that destination, should be that we have a world where there is abundance for all. And we can see boys, girls, east and west, north, south, Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, that they can have these lofty optimism that the future is one of abundance and one hopeful livable for moments of glory. Thank you so much for the invitation and stay blessed and enjoy your program. Please eat Nkobi, Amala, and Zoro. Bye-bye. Thank you.